Now, tonight, we are here for an extra 30-minute presentation with Cody Ash. <laughs> so thank you so much for coming. Can you tell everyone a little bit about yourself? Yeah, thank you both very much for having me. It's wonderful to be here. Thank you all for, for coming out. Uh, so I feel in some ways that uh, I'm destined to talk about this subject, uh, seeing as how I was born June 28th of the 130th anniversary of, uh, of the burning of the Wrightsville Bridge in, in York Hospital. So uh, it's always been a subject near and dear to, to my heart. Uh, but I'm a graduate of West York High School, so uh, from, from York County. Um, went to Shippensburg University, graduated in 2014 uh, with a bachelor's degree in communication journalism and a history minor. Uh, privileged now to serve as the director of education and museum operations at Seminary Bridge Museum and Education Center in Gettysburg. How uh, long have you been there? Uh, since 2013. Okay. So we opened in 2013 for the 150th anniversary of the battle. Uh, for those who have not visited, it's in the original building on the campus of the Lutheran Seminary. And we discussed the first day of the battle in a building that is at the core of that July 1st, 1863 battlefield. Uh, the story of the seminary hospital for about two and a half months after the battle. And then the bigger picture issues of race and religion debated in the very walls of the seminary building. So if you have an opportunity, please come visit us the next time you're in Gettysburg. Mm, very cool. Right, and since the topic tonight really was centered around the burning of the bridge, can you just take us through that very first day when the Confederates came into Wrightsville? Let's start there. Sure, so just kind of a, a very brief 30 seconds or so of the Gettysburg campaign up to this point. Of course, we're in the third summer of the American Civil War. Uh, Robert E. Lee's Confederate Army of Northern Virginia at the beginning of June 1863 has stepped out of the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia uh, will come up the Shenandoah Valley into the Cumberland Valley, ultimately crossing the Mason-Dixon line into the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania starting June 15th. And it's really over the course of the next 10 days that the plan starts to formulate for Lee's army. And the vanguard of Lee's force is going to be about a third of his army, uh, one corps commanded by Richard Yule. And Yule is going to give one of his division commanders, Jubal Early, the general who will ultimately come through York and whose forces would come here to Wrightsville. On June 25th, 1863, he lays out the plan that will culminate uh, almost right where we're sitting. And in his words, I'll quote him directly, Yule tells Early uh, to cross the South Mountain to Gettysburg, proceed to York, cut the Northern Central Railroad running from Baltimore to Harrisburg, and also to destroy the bridge across the Susquehanna at Wrightsville and Columbia on the branch road from York to work Philadelphia. So he's defining the exact roads that he wants them to, to follow, the exact railroads that he wants them to cut. And the initial plan, as we will see that will change, is for Confederate forces to destroy the bridge here from Wrightsville to Columbia. Now, through the next few days, almost every single piece of that plan is going to go uh, exactly as Buell had planned and Early, Early had planned. Uh, there will be engagements throughout York County, uh, uh, showing of Confederate forces at places like Hanover Junction in southern York County, uh, the capture of the city of York uh, itself and the borough of York on June 27th into the morning of the 28th. And meanwhile, here at Wrightsville on June 28th, there is this uh, militia force that is taking shape. It's kind of a, a, a mix-match group of individuals. Uh, Pennsylvania Governor Andrew Curtin in the days preceding this has called for 60,000 volunteers to quell this emergency of the invasion of Confederate forces. Wow. Of those 60,000 men he had hoped for, he's only gotten about 7,000. Uh, these are 60-day volunteers. Uh, there will be basically three of these units in these days, uh, June 26th through 28th, that will have a major impact on these events. One is the 26th Militia, which is at Gettysburg on June 26th, and will encounter Early's men but flee relatively quickly. About 50 of those men will join the militia force that's here at Wrightsville on June 28th. Uh, the 27th Pennsylvania militia will be here in force. These are commanded by Jacob Frick, who is a colonel in the United States Army and native of Pottsville. Cody, you might interrupt you quick. So how did, it, if I'm a person who is asked to come and volunteer, how did they get notified? Were there letters that went out? Was there questions in the church? Like, how did these men know about the opportunity? Uh, so newspaper announcements uh, would have been one way. You also would have had recruiters who would have gone into uh, town squares and, and started, you know, announcing. So uh, exactly, soapboxing, getting up on a, not on like a, you know, a politician giving a stump speech. Uh, typically reading that, that proclamation. 
And one really interesting case of the men who come here to Wrightsville is that in addition to the 26th and the 27th and portions of the 20th Pennsylvania militia, which had been uh, pushed out of Hanover Junction the day before, two days before here at, at Wrightsville, uh, there are wounded soldiers from the Maryland campaign, the Battle of Antietam, uh, veterans of units like the 23rd Pennsylvania Infantry, and even elements of the famous Iron Brigade, uh, Western units from Wisconsin, uh, eventually Michigan, as well as Indiana. And there are going to be men in the, uh, these wounded men who are in the General Hospital, the United States General Hospital in York at what is today Penn Park, Penn, Penn Common. And a uh, couple of individuals, Granville Howler, who is a York uh, native, who is going to volunteer his services to the Commonwealth, uh, as, well as, as well as William Franklin, a general in the United States Army, former Corps commander. Uh, they're going to go to these wounded men in the days preceding what happens here at Wrightsville. And they're going to ask these troops, you're now several months removed from your wounds. You're able, perhaps, to pick up a rifle. Will you come with us to Wrightsville? And 187 men will say yes, 185 of whom are uh, recovering from wounds. And so they will join the force here at, at Wrightsville uh, simply because they are, they are asked to once again come to, uh, come to the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania service, even though they're not specifically from Pennsylvania. And then, and then also I think uh, maybe most significantly from a national perspective of the troops who are here to defend Wrightsville, uh, approximately 50 to 60 African Americans from Columbia uh, workers at a, a rolling mill uh, are going to come across the Susquehanna and uh, start digging in with these with these uh, uh, militiamen, these white militiamen, uh, and they are credited by Colonel Frick, who uh, is sort of in overall command on this sector of the, the battlefield, if you will, on June 28th. Uh, high praise from a man, Colonel Frick, who was a, a two-time Medal of Honor recipient during the course of the Civil War, who says that it was these black men who actually uh, dug the longest, held out the longest when the, the fight actually yeah, starts. The yeah. 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 So um, York is going to be occupied June 27th, June 28th. Confederate forces will continue uh, pressing through. Uh, Jubal Early is going to essentially hold York for ransom, asking for things like shoes, socks, uh, $100,000 in cash, which is more than $2 million today. Wow. Uh, he'll get a little less than half of that. Uh, but he's going to send one of his brigades uh, under the command of John Gordon uh, here to Wrightsville. Gordon is going to be at the head of these Confederate forces that will come up and over the hill of Wrightsville and ultimately uh, down here right toward the, the river. Uh, the uh, Pennsylvania militia defense basically makes a large ring around the, the, around the town of Wrightsville itself. Uh, there are three artillery pieces, three cannon used in this defense. All three are actually placed on the Columbia side of the river, on the eastern side of the river. Um, but there's this militia force of a little more than 1,000 men uh, against a Confederate force of probably about 1,200 initially, a little larger than that, uh, ultimately. But it's a relatively short affair. Uh, it will only actually take place, will the fighting, for probably 20 minutes, half hour or so. Um, relatively few soldiers. Tactically, it's, it's relatively insignificant, but it's what happens next that has ramifications for the overall plan of Lee's army from a bigger picture uh, strategic sense. So as we talked about a bit ago, the, the initial plan is mm -hmm. for Confederate forces to, uh, to destroy the bridge. Uh, <coughs> these Union forces, these, these Pennsylvania militiamen, as well as some militia from surrounding states like Maryland, New York, and New Jersey, uh, they're going to be in defense of this position, but ultimately realize that they are going to have to start pulling back to the other side of the river. Uh, they are going to be under duress from these continued Confederate attacks. Uh, Howler, as well as Colonel Frick, will say that it's really the Confederate artillery, which would have been positioned uh, pretty much right astride Route 30 today, mm -hmm. uh, right off the exit. Uh, it's really, that's really what sort of drives them back. In preparation for this defense, earlier in the week, the day or so before, uh, the fourth section from the west, so the fourth section from this side of the bridge, uh, is cut. Uh, there are going to be men who, who saw it or basically preparing it in the event that these federal forces would have to withdraw. Mm -hmm. They would have the means by which they could destroy a piece of the bridge and hopefully that would stop any sort of Confederate pursuit. Yeah, how late? So if, if they knew the Confederates were coming, because at this point we had been at war for three years, when, how, because if someone said to me, you're going to have to cut the bridge, I would probably wait until last minute because what if I am damaging my own property and well-being for nothing? 
So how long did they wait until finally they said, you've got to destroy parts of the bridge? So this is just the day or so uh, right before. So the, the entrenchments really aren't being dug until the 26th, 27th. So they wait for a long time. They wait until pretty much right toward the end. And, and it, you know, to put, to put this in an even bigger context, um, the reason why Wrightsville is so significant for, for either side, the reason why Confederates are coming here, is when we think about transportation across the Susquehanna River, right. uh, a mile and a quarter from, from here to the other side, uh, there is no other bridge fording the entire river anywhere between Harrisburg and Conowingo, Maryland at the, at the Chesapeake Bay. And so if you are transporting a portion of an army or an everyday traveler, this is your only chance to get across. Uh, to get across the river. And so this is an absolute necessity in terms of being able to cross for, for Confederate forces. And the plan here is to join up with the other portions of Richard Ewell's Corps, about another 20,000 Confederate soldiers who are moving through the Cumberland Valley up toward Carlisle with an ultimate goal of at least making an impression in front of, front of Harrisburg, across the Susquehanna from Harrisburg. And so these Confederate forces are trying to get across the river here and as, as early and, and Gordon said, attack Harrisburg from the rear. Of course, a, a city doesn't really have a front or a back side, but mm -hmm. the idea being that it would be from the side not facing the Susquehanna mm -hmm. okay. River. And so um, with all of that in mind, Governor Curtin is going to apparently proclaim in the days leading up to this that the two main places in the entire Commonwealth of Pennsylvania that he has the most concern with as Confederate forces enter the state are Chambersburg, Pennsylvania, because of its access to the Cumberland Valley, the valley system, and Wrightsville because of the bridge crossing mm. here. And so it, it certainly wouldn't have been a decision taken lightly to potentially have to destroy a piece of the bridge and ultimately the entire thing. Uh, when, when the initial plan to, to blow it doesn't work, they have to burn it. Um, but it's something that is n seen as a necessity uh, if they're going to cut off the Confederate advance mm. across the river and, and cease them from advancing any yeah. further. So we were at the point where we're starting to cut the bridge. Let's start talking about them actually burning it and having to go from, okay, we've cut it, we've mined it, nothing's going the way we thought it would, we have to destroy the entire bridge. Yep, and so there, you know, in the midst of this, you have to consider every, all, all the chaos that is happening. You have not just uh, trying to destroy the bridge, but you have a thousand or a little more soldiers trying to retreat across it. You have an advancing force. Um, you have townspeople who are probably looking on and worried that um, in the midst of this fire that is apparently about to start, will it have an impact upon their town, both in Wrightsville as well as in uh, Columbia? Uh, there's a story from the 23rd Pennsylvania, uh, which had some of those wounded soldiers uh, from, uh, from uh, Antietam, who are, uh, as well as Fredericksburg, who are here. And uh, there, there's this story where apparently along the side of the bridge there was a footpath, but it was not accessible the entire way across. And, uh, as these soldiers are trying to run across the, the bridge, um, one of these men decides he's going to use this footpath. And he gets to a point where he can't advance any further. And he climbs through a window on the side of the bridge. And so men are, uh, my point there is men are using every means available to them mm. to get back across. Uh, mm. In terms of, a, from a military standpoint, there is a, a bridgehead established. If you read a lot about World War II, for instance, you'll see this very common throughout throughout the Normandy invasion, but these, there's a bridgehead. There is a, this defensive force. These militiamen are, are preparing for the fact that there might still be a fight at the bridge, potentially, uh, as they're going across. But uh, the, the bridge will, uh, will be lit, uh, ultimately pretty much entirely consumed. Uh, flames will spread. On the Columbia side, there are going to be residents uh, sawing pieces of, of the bridge and other uh, wooden fixtures so that the fire doesn't spread to homes there. Mm -hmm. And now on this side of the river, there's the, the sort of uh, irony of the fact that the Confederates were initially planning to mm -hmm. destroy the bridge, yeah. thinking they would get across, and then there would be nobody for, to pursue them. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, their goal is to extinguish the flames, to not let mm -hmm. the town of Wrightsville burn any further. Uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and John Gordon has this couple of lines in his memoir where he says, uh, when my plan was to extinguish the, the flames on the bridge, I called out to the people of Wrightsville asking for, for buckets, and they didn't. They said that there were none available. But as soon as <laughs> as soon as the the uh, <laughs> got to the house, gets to the house they have buckets show up. That's buckets. so funny. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so there will be this effort to uh, to extinguish the flames mm -hmm. here, uh, as, as well as I mentioned in Columbia. 
And uh, Gordon will mention in his official report that he submits just a couple of weeks later, he says that uh, uh, he's very frustrated by the fact that uh, the Confederates are immediately demonized for burning the bridge when he tries to clarify that this was, uh, this was not the case. Which for some context, there is some destruction of infrastructure, military value to this point. Uh, Early makes no bones about the fact that he wanted to destroy the Caledonia Iron Works west of Gettysburg because they're owned by Daddy Stevens, a, a radical Republican abolitionist, uh, held the town of, of York for ransom. Uh, and, and, and then of course we see the destruction of the bridge not caused by Confederates, right. but everything leading up to this point, the image is that it would have been. So thinking about what's fun about history, especially happening 150 years ago, is that it's up for interpretation. So what, how can we look back at this moment in Wrightsville history, at the burning of the bridge? What does it say about the people that lived here? Um, what does it say about our reaction to Confederates? Like, what's the takeaway from this? I would say that the two big takeaways tying this to kind of bigger picture of, of Civil War as well as just general American history. Um, one is that this is the, let's see if I can phrase this that everybody will, will understand what I mean by it. Um, this is the case, maybe more so than any other I can think of during the Civil War, where you have a generally insignificant tactical moment, very small, very short military engagement, but one that is so small yet has such wide ranging strategic uh, importance and significance. It, it really does throw off at least one third of Robert E. Lee's mm. plan as he moves into Pennsylvania. Wow, okay. uh, when you think about his army, they're basically to the west of Chambersburg and Cashtown, to the north of Carlisle and toward Harrisburg, and east through York and, and Wrightsville. And this immediately cuts off that piece of it. These men now have no choice but to pull back, join the rest of Lee's army, mm. and the same day that this is happening, United States Army of the Potomac has a new commander, George Meade, who's uh, who's intent on moving north toward Pennsylvania. And Lee learns that uh, from, from the spy Walter Harrison, probably that day, that he has to start concentrating. And so all of this is happening in part because of what happens almost right where we're sitting. Uh, the other thing that is nationally significant that I think is well overlooked is this is perhaps the first time that soldiers from Robert E. Lee's Confederate Army, arguably the most significant army in the Confederacy, are facing black soldiers on the other side of the battlefield. Mm -hmm. Uh, these 50, 60 African Americans, uh, one of whom is, is killed here, unidentified, um, this is the first time that in this theater of the American Civil War this has been seen. Many of these men will become soldiers in United States color troop regiments. Just a couple of weeks later, uh, there will be the, the fight at, uh, at Fort Wagner in, in South Carolina with the 54th Massachusetts, including a number of men from Columbia. But in terms of this particular theater of conflict, uh, this is the first time that uh, in this portion of the Civil War, there will be black men holding arms against Confederate That's forces. I'm really surprised we don't learn more about that. I'm so glad mm -hmm. that you exposed that to us. This is fascinating. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned 1,200 men under Gordon that arrived here. Did, so that doesn't include the Comanche, White's Comanches that were the cavalry that came in to destroy the bridges leading to Wright's Hill. Yep, pretty significant. Good, good. Thank you for mentioning that. So Early's division overall is about 6,600 soldiers. Um, that includes infantry brigades as well as, uh, as cavalry units, uh, such as those under Elijah White, the 5th, uh, 35th Virginia Battalion. And, uh, these forces would have been at the railroad junction at, at Hanover, Hanover Junction uh, just the day earlier. Uh, they'll come here then to support Gordon's men. Uh, an important thing, just very briefly, in terms of cavalry that is significant here, is that uh, Granville Haller and uh, Jacob Frick, in command of the, the, the Pennsylvania and other uh, union, uh, unionist militia here, uh, they mention in their reports the fact that they didn't really have cavalry support the way the Confederate troops did. Uh, there are two bends in the river with ridges overlooking them, but they said we would have needed, I think they say something like five times the number of soldiers that we had to actually make it stretch that far. Mm -hmm. And so the mobility and the scouting capabilities of Confederate forces uh, is another advantage, in addition to the fact that they are, are trained, you know, regular, not regular, but, but trained Confederate Army soldiers versus militia. But uh, certainly an important point that there is cavalry support here as well. Yes? So this story of talking about the bridge is something that we've done some interpretation on the water on the boats with. And so I want to see if you would characterize this the same way that I do when I talk about this. I think if you were one of those militia people, it was incredibly frightening to have this force coming at you. They're, they're like special. 
special forces. They now have been fighting for three years from the Confederacy. These guys mm -hmm. run 12 to 14 miles a day. They have very little food, they travel light, and they scream at you. This corporate, they scream when they come at you. And I can't imagine these men like three weeks, like anybody in this room, like three weeks later, you wanna go dig a ditch and stand there and hold a gun you've never held before? I think like that, that is what these people were facing. Uh, even the muskets were old, as far as I know. Like they were using a really old gun, and, and Frick sends them out about six feet apart. So like a peacock is trying to look bigger than he is. Is that fair when I tell people that story in that way? Is that from what you know? Is that correct? Yeah, I mean these are, are green soldiers for the most part. And even those who are not, it's been a while since they've been on a battlefield. And even for those who have been engaged against Confederates or have seen Confederates in the days prior to this, uh, each time they've, they've fled. And now they have nothing but a river to their back. And so all of that must play in their minds. Uh, early in Gordon, early or Gordon, I forget which, maybe both, mentions the fact that from their perspective, they can see a bit of a change in the mentality here compared to the previous days. When you consider the fact that when they clear the, uh, clear the Shenandoah Valley, Robert Milroy's Union troops put on a fight at the Second Battle of Winchester, but Confederates clear the valley. They're able to, to move up relatively uh, with relative uh, ease. Uh, when they get to Gettysburg, the 26th militia pretty much just moves out of the way, and, and they're able to continue moving through. The, the city of York will surrender without any fight. And now suddenly they get here on June 28th, and though it's against this frightened home guard, essentially. Uh, they do put up a 20 minute or so engagement. Mm. There are 30 or so casualties, most are captured, but nevertheless, there's a, a bit more of, a, of an engagement here that seems to perhaps even gain the respect to a degree by, by these Confederate, Confederate forces. Um, one thing that's not directly related to that, but when you mentioned about votes that I do, I, I do think is important and overlooked aspect of this, is we have to wonder when you think about well, how do, how do people get across the river when the bridge is, is out? And a great example of this uh, comes to us from Martha Eller, who is a representative of the Patriot Daughters of Lancaster, uh, a, a benevolent women's association which will go to Gettysburg in the days uh, after the battle to uh, treat wounded soldiers, including at, at the uh, Lutheran Seminary, where I have the privilege to work now. And, um, and she mentions the long lines of people who are in Columbia trying to get on these ferry boats, uh, which are going to be just small boats that have uh, ropes that, that uh, they're using to kind of channel across the river. So uh, there are mass amounts of people, think about all the people who had fled Adams or York County in the days leading up to this because of the Confederate forces approaching, especially African Americans and mass groups are escaping so that they're not uh, potentially taken in slavery or worse. And now all these people, once the Confederates are out of Pennsylvania in the first, second week of July, they have to get back across. And there's no bridge there to mm. do so. Wow. What if it like that? Yeah. Mm. And all their assets. Yeah, mm. all their assets. Yeah, she right. mentions about how many people have like carriages and how difficult it is to get these onto these boats, and that takes up more space. I want to thank Curdy for pointing out the significance of Riceville during the war. I may be a little biased, but I've always been to Riceville at the center of the universe. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, in, in regards to that, um, while you're here in Riceville, or uh, live here and come here, but we've, we've started putting in place uh, the interpretive boards from the Civil War Trails, civilwartrails.org, it is. Uh, we have one up, uh, two up on uh, the end of Cherry Street about the Mifflin House and its significance, where they shot cannons from, and, and actually a couple of buildings in town still have the scars from the cannonball. Oh, that's cool. Um, up on uh, Long, uh, up on uh, Locust Street. Hmm. Uh, we have uh, one down here, uh, actually over here, at the, uh, uh, down where John Wright is. Uh, right next to that, we have a little park up on Commons Park. And right there, pointing, uh, sitting there, we have one tell a story about the bridge, mm. um, which we were assisted in putting in place with Jim's writing partner there. Uh, and uh, there's also uh, one up on uh, Helen Street that talks about the other house up here, uh, the other mansion that's right up here across from the post office. So you can find them on the app. That's we kind of did this because it gets people from away from here into here to find out really how significant it is and 
why we don't want to speak with a southern accent because <laughs> they got to cross there and to Harrisburg. You know. <laughs> Um, well, thank you everyone for joining us again tonight. That is a wrap, but I'm sure Cody would love to hang out. If you have any other questions, grab him, grab Dami or myself, and we'd love to talk with you. So thank you very much. Let's give Cody a round of applause. Thank you.